Alright everyone, we are going to get started, so I just want to say thank you one and all for coming to tonight's uh, Mustang Mania uh, History Night here at the Fargo Air Museum. Uh, before we get started, I'm going to make a few quick announcements. Um, veterans Coffee Hour is tomorrow from 8 to noon, uh, so veterans come in, enjoy free coffee and donut on the Fargo Air Museum, and you can socialize and share your stories with your peers. Um, the Veterans Day coming up, also you'll notice at some of the tables behind you, we have cards that you can write a thank you letter to veterans, um, whether you have a family member that's a veteran, if yourself are a veteran, thank you for your service. Um, but yeah, we'll uh, hand those out tomorrow at Veterans Day to our coffee goers. Um, Month of Giving is uh, it's coming up starting from on November 15th through December 15th. Um, the Month of Giving highlights the various aspects of our mission, informing donors of what we do to promote aviation through educa excuse me, education, preservation, and restoration, as you can see over here with our B-25 in action. Um, so the Fargo Air Museum would be um, very thankful if you thought of us during this time period. Um, and then lastly, for the younger kids in the crowd, uh, we have Santa flying in on Saturday, December 16th. Doors open at 9.30, so um, for the little ones in your life, make sure that they have their Christmas lists ready and they can get up close and take photos with Santa. Um, so with all that in mind, we're going to get started here. I am joined today up on stage by two absolutely amazing speakers. We have Mark Tisler, the Vice President of Restoration at Air Corps Aviation in Bemidji, Minnesota, and then Toby McPherson, who is the owner of Tall Towers Aviation out of Page, North Dakota, and the owner of this P-51 Mustang here, nicknamed Boomer. So we're going to start off, um, Mark will be answering questions first, and then we will be going into Toby. All right. yourself, um, where you're from, your educational background, all of that time? Yeah, I, I grew up as a, a kid out in the state of Washington. And, uh, my dad was a uh, uh, Navy helicopter pilot, and when he got done with that, he ended up getting a job with Northwest Airlines, but, you know, they're based in Minneapolis, but he, they had a base in Seattle, so he stayed in Seattle, and, and uh, so that's kind of part of my aviation uh, interest, and then, uh, my mom always wanted to get me into other things, and so I was—I remember kind of one of my youngest recollections. I was in a, like a PB soccer league, and it was on a grass or on a grass field uh, next to a little grass airport. And so while I'm out there trying to play the game, I'm watching the airplanes fly around and just not not paying attention to what I'm supposed to be paying attention to. So that was kind of something that seemed to stick in my mind that airplanes were the thing for me, and, and uh, so I. Uh, Grew up on a little hobby farm, uh, running machinery. Uh, and we had all the all the, the farm animals type things that you could have on a hobby farm, and, and uh, you know, obviously it was my mechanical stuff that uh, that was my interest is how to fix things. So my it's kind of my, my nickname is Mister Fix It. If anything is broken, I can usually figure out how to fix it. Um, so I, uh, as I was finished up in high school, I you know I. My interest in aviation kept growing. Uh, a friend of my dad's, another airline pilot, always had airplane projects, and uh, so I went and helped him occasionally working on a, a Cessna Skymaster. So it's really a funny looking airplane. It has an engine in front and an engine in back. So they call it a push me pull me. And uh, so that was a project that I helped out. And in exchange for that, he was going to give me flight instruction at the time. And uh, so I, I worked on that for a while. And uh, so I got to decide, well, I want to be an airplane mechanic, and I was going to go to a &P school out there in Western Washington, and my dad's like, well, you've got good enough grades, and I can afford to send you to college, you need to go to college, so you don't come back when you're 50 years old and say, oh, you didn't give me a chance. So I said, oh, okay, I'll go to college. Uh, so I went to Washington State University, uh, I took a degree, uh, I got an uh, agricultural mechanization degree, so I was called, it's one step down from ag engineer, you don't have to do math. And, uh, so I finished that program in four years with minimum, absolute minimum credits, and uh, I wanted to go to A&P school. So I started looking around, and uh, in the old days there was what they call trade plane. It's the, the yellow sheets that uh, 
uh, where all the aviation ads were at, where you buy parts or services, or whatever. And I found an ad for Dakota Aerotech uh, in Fargo, North Dakota that had the AMP program. It was a one-year school, so you could go in and get it done because I wanted an eight-hour-a-day job. And so I came here to Fargo a month out of college, went through the program, and I was getting close to the end of the program. And uh, an airplane showed up, the Warbird airplane, the T-28, that I was, you know, I was like, oh, wow, cool, you know, where's that from? And then my instructor, uh, Maynard, I don't know if uh, probably some of you here probably know him. Uh, he's, I think, went down to, he was from Iowa originally, a uh, football player. Anyway, he's one of the instructors. And he's like, oh, there's this guy down in Lofton. He's got a B-25 Corsair, a bunch of junk like that. And I'm like, oh, really? And I hopped in my car on the weekend, and I went down there, and I just kind of hung out and shop, just doing whatever I could to get associated with these kind of airplanes, because all of the jobs at that time were in California, Texas, Florida. And it's like you couldn't be uh, expected to go there and work and make a living at doing it. It was kind of more of a hobby. And uh, so anyway, I got to know Jerry uh, just over a, probably a month's time. And uh, he had a Corsair project there that was sitting underneath a tarp. And uh, that's my favorite airplane, uh, Corsair or B-25, either one. And so I said, well, can I come down and spend the summer working on your Corsair? And he's like, oh, sure, when can you start? And he said, well, got a half a day of school on Monday, I'll take you here Tuesday. He's like, okay. And he, out the door he goes into his, pops into his thrush and takes off, he's out spraying weeds. And uh, so that was kind of my job interview. I was only gonna stay for the summer because I didn't like North Dakota winters. And I ended up staying 23 years. And, uh, and then kind of, uh, you know, kind of ran its course, um, and uh, then I got in with uh, a couple other guys, and then we started our own shop in Bemidji doing the same thing. So that's been there 12 years now. So. Gotcha. That answered quite a few questions I had on there. Um, so I've heard from many in the warbird industry that you are the expert on Mustangs. So would you mind walking us through um, the development of the Mustang, its variants, um, technical data, you know, off the top of your head? Yeah, well, um, so I have this book that was published a couple years ago. It's called P fifty one B Mustang, and as you can see, it's really thick. And so a B and a C Mustang are essentially the same airplane. They're just built in two different factories. And uh, so this book uh, has a a good history of North American aviation. So when in the late thirties, you know, there was uh, Dalton Douglas. Uh, there was uh, Glenn Martin Company, Boeing Company. Uh, so North American was kind of like the new kids on the block, and a lot of the, there was quite a few of the developers from there that came from other manufacturers that went to North America. So they had a different way of thinking of how to build things. And uh, we were currently, uh, well, we finished the P-47 called Bonnie that's up at the Dakota Territory Museum. Uh, we're working on a P-38 right now. And, and uh, of course, the Corsair that was here in the museum was one that I restored. That was my first project. It took me 10 years <laughs> off and on to finish restoring that airplane for Jerry. And uh, so when you look at the structures of those kind of those airplanes, the early uh, manufacturers were very complicated. And when North America came along, they're like, well, we want to build airplanes. We, we want to be like the Henry Ford. We want to build them fast and cheap. And so when you look at the number of airplanes built during World War II, uh, I don't know what the percentage is, but North America probably built like almost half of them, I would bet. And, uh, and so their, their, the structures were very simple to build compared to other manufacturers. And uh, so they're, they're, but anyway, so, the, so these, these guys all got together and uh, uh, formed North American, or North American, uh, yeah, North American Aviation. Um, so they had built a couple other smaller airplanes, um, and finally, they, you know, they're trying to get government contracts. They made a couple of trainers, and then they started developing their own fighter design based around an Allison engine. But it wasn't the Mustang. And uh, so, kind of, some of you probably know the story that the British, obviously, you know, they were in the war. They needed airplanes. They they wanted somebody to build them airplanes. They came to the U.S. and everybody's like, "Oh, you got to buy B-40s." And they're like, "Ah, we don't want B-40s. We already have airplanes that are better than that. We want something better than what we have." And so they they talked to uh, North American, and they, they said, well, we want you to give us a proposal, like, what can you, what can you do? And it was over, like, a, I think the trip from L.A. to, to uh, D.C. or New York, I can't remember where it was, where they had a meeting. They sketched it out on the napkin, which is the story everybody hears, and then they say, well, they built it in 120 days. Well, 
actually, when I looked through the book last night, they built the airplane in 102 days, and they waited 18 days to get an engine from Allison. So when they started the, the project, uh, uh, it was like the second week of April, I think, in 1940, uh, they started. So it was actually before we got in before they started developing the Mustang. So they uh, got this contract. Well, so they went to Allison and said, hey, well, we're going to build an airplane in 100, and, uh, 100 days. And Allison laughed at it and said, yeah, yeah, right. Well, nobody built an airplane in 120 days, so they just kind of stalled off of getting the airplane. Well, then they got it done, and they said, well, we need an engine. They're like, oh, well, uh, you know, so then actually the airport had an engine that they gave to North America to use to, to do the first flight of the airplane. And uh, so, of course, that was the XP-51. So it was a, uh, or actually, uh, it was a NA-73X was their prototype. And then, so they went through all these different variations of, of uh, uh, models. So, you know, a lot of people say everybody sees the D-model Mustang with the bubble top, which was, you know, the premier, or what I would call the premier of the, the Mustang line. Um, but it actually started off, so they, the, the first airplanes that were built weren't built for America. They, built, they were built for the British, so they had what they called a, a Mustang Mark I. Uh, so it had an Allison in it. It had, uh, uh, I believe, four fifty caliber machine guns and four thirty caliber machine guns. So it had... You know, eight guns where the D model only has six, but when they went from four to six, everybody goes, oh, look how much, well, they already have more than that before. And, uh, but in that initial contract, they, their desire was to have them 20 millimeter cannons, and they couldn't get cannons because they were all, uh, the, the supply that was being built was going to other airplanes, so they, they, couldn't, they couldn't produce enough of them to get them, so the British had to wait to get cannons. And uh, so they built that first, batch of like 600 uh, Mark I Mustangs. And then they built a, a 1A, which was actually the one that came with cannons. Uh, and I didn't know that until years, you know, probably 20 years ago. I, 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 somebody said, oh yeah, they have a Mustang with cannons. I'm like, ah, I don't think so. And then the more research you do, sure enough, they built 150 airplanes with 20 millimeter cannons. And most of them went to the British. We kept a few here for development. And actually two of those that we kept were the airplanes they converted to put the Merlin engine in. And, uh, so there's another really good book uh, written by a, a guy in England that sold, when the British got their first Mustang, they flew up and they're like, yeah, they're okay, but they're not a Spitfire. Uh, they were faster at low level, but they didn't have the performance at altitude because of the Allison wasn't one engine that was made to go to altitude. So they're try they started their own process of trying to put a Merlin engine into a Mustang. And they, they were successful at it, they took them a while. But their ultimate idea was they wanted to put a uh, Rolls-Royce Griffin engine, which is the difference between a small block Chevy and a big block Chevy, basically from a Merlin to something even bigger. And that would have been just an animal to fly. But that, you know, they were looking for interceptors. So they want something to take off and climb the altitude as quick as possible, so more horsepower and better. So they built that those, those uh, what they called the uh, Mustang Mark 1As. And then they built the next one, finally, the, the U.S. Air Force, after getting a few of those airplanes, they said, hey, well, maybe we need one, but we don't have money. The, the war is on. We can't, we don't have a uh, pursuit aircraft in our in our budget, but we can buy attack aircraft. So they said, oh, okay, well, let's modify one of these. And they put, they put dive brakes on it, and they put bomb racks on it so it could carry a bomb load and use it as a dive bomber. And that way it got kind of the, the factory going and up higher speed because obviously they knew the war was coming and they were in more airplanes either for other countries or us, you know, depending on how the war went. And, uh, so they built those and then uh, and then a lot of the Mustangs, like the Jerry we built in Washington called P-51A. Uh, so that was the next generation. And uh, so it actually had less firepower. It only had four guns on it, uh, but was a higher altitude engine, but still an Alice and that was the last. Allison engine airplane that they built. They built, I think somewhere, it was around 1,500 Allison powered airplanes out of the total Mustang production was about 15,000, so 10%. And so, yeah, 15, 8, 28. And uh, so the, when people come and ask me at an air show, say, oh, well, does it have a Merlin or an Allison? You know, and it's like, well, the easiest way to tell is that a Merlin engine airplane will have a four blader propeller and an Allison powered airplane will have a three-blade propeller. 
And so that's the, the dead giveaway as to which model it is if you if you're not if you're not a Mustang nerd like I am. Um, so once they finish those Allison productions, uh, they were having trouble getting Allison engines because of the other airplanes that were using them. So early on, there got to be a little turf war going on, and uh, Packard Motor Company was uh, working with the British to, to, to build uh, Merlin engines in, in the U.S., uh, mainly to supply Canada because they were building Lancasters and Mosquitoes and Hurricanes. And so they, were, they wanted to have a supply. They didn't want to have to build the engines in Europe and ship them over here to put it in an airplane and then ship it back. And so they wanted to get a factory up to, to speed build these engines. Well, they had to re-engineer the, the, the Merlin to make it manufacturable because in Britain, they, they, the Merlins were all hand-built engines. And they were more reliable and lasted longer, but they couldn't get the capacity. And we were all about building quantity, not quality. You know, get it done if it lasts 150 hours, that's all you could expect out of it. And we'll just keep building more. And uh, so, they, so early on in the, in the Mustang development, there was a, uh, they wanted to put uh, a Merlin engine in as soon as possible just because they knew that that was a better engine and for altitude. Um, the bomber formations you know, flew in the mid-20,000 foot range and the Allison engine really struggled to get to that altitude. So they knew that that's where they were going to be fighting the Germans, so they needed a, an engine that could operate at that altitude. And uh, so they, they built, they got finally got the production going in the, in the B model uh, Mustangs. Um, I think the contract I wrote down here that uh, in June of 42 uh, is when the first Merlin engine Mustangs were, were ordered. And so they didn't start delivering those, I think, until about the end of the year. And then they built, uh, I think it was 2,500 uh, B and C models. So uh, on the screen, you'll see there's a, uh, well, like one that's up there now is a, a B or B model. So it has a, a Razorback canopy versus a bubble. And they built, I think, about 2,500 of that variant of the B and C. And then uh, they realized that the visibility, the cockpit was pretty skinny, so it was really hard to look around and, and find you know, other aircraft. Uh, and so they decided, well, we'll put the bubble camp down. So they took one of the BC airplanes and they just drilled the top off of it and then built the bubble top and put on there. And, uh, and the pilots, you know, they really liked it for visibility but it was actually slower because of the, the drag on the bubble over the other airplanes. It was 10 to 20 miles an hour difference in speed. So some of the guys that had been there liked the speed over the visibility. So you know, they could get the, get the bounce on the Germans. That was, that was more important than being able to hunt them. Well. And uh, of course, later in the war, the, the quality of the German pilots obviously diminished as the numbers did. And, One of the reasons, you know, why they wanted to go to the e model Mustang, and and the, you know, extended range too. And so then, one of the other airplanes that, and so that the D's came out, and there was a, a variant called the K, which was the same thing, but it had a, a, a different propeller. So they, they wanted to, you know, thinking that well, you know, if something happens and some, somebody bombs a factory and we can't get propellers, we need a, a, a secondary source. So they they, they had the Aero Products Company, which I think was a subsidiary, they, they built a, a hollow steel propeller and they built about 1,500 of the K model Mustangs. And uh, so they're fairly rare. There's only, uh, well, uh, probably three original K model Mustangs left and there's actually one here on this airport, so it's really cool. Um, so the, then, then after the, the D's and the K's, they started, uh, and, and actually it was early on, um, the British, uh, they had different stress uh, requirements for their airplanes than the U.S. And I, I read one last night that was really, I thought, kind of surprising to me. The landing gear system on, the, on a Mustang, like for side loading and, and forward nap, uh, is designed to like seven and a half G loading, and the British were only like four and a half. And so their airplanes were, they you know, had basically the Merlin and the Spitfire was the same engine, but the airplane airframe was way lighter. And so the North American thought, well, there's an advantage here. Can we start to shave this Mustang down and make it perform better uh, by lightening it up? And uh, so 
So they, they went into a program, actually, uh, let's see, it was in uh, July of 43, they started a program, uh, the Spider Airplane Range Extension Program. Uh, uh, yeah. And they, uh, so by lighting up these airplanes, it was actually June of 43 that they started on that. Um, so they built several prototypes uh, and using Merlin engine, Lauren Allison engine, and different props. And they shaved about 1,500 pounds off of the, the D model airplane and to increase performance. And out of that, they ended up with what the airplane called the uh, H model Mustang. So they had a, a, a Merlin engine that was upgraded with the, the, the Aeroprox propeller on it. And it didn't look anything really like a Mustang. And a lot of people say that, but really, I, believe they, they, I, I think they like it. <laughs> but, uh, so, but they didn't come out until very late in the war, almost right at the end, so they didn't have any, any significance. But they used them in post war in the Air Guards in, uh, in Korean War a little bit. And, uh, so then, obviously, from there, then the, uh, there was one uh, from the H model, then later they built what they called Twin Mustang. And so, uh, yeah. Too, and they had one at the uh, EEA at the Oshkosh Air Show a couple years ago that they, it was one of the uh, prototype ones that somebody had found part of it and rebuilt it. And there is one original complete one in civilian hands in, in Minneapolis. And then I think there's three more that are on military bases on display. And so there's a chance that there'll be two of those flyable at some point here in, in the future. And, uh, and that was used mainly in the Korean War as a, a, a night interceptor bad weather, so we had two cockpits, so you could have a relief pilot, and or you know, you, the second pilot would be the radar operator and, and all that, so. And then one thing that was really interesting on the, on the range extension on the Mustang, um, so they started, uh, you know, they, 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 there was, that was always a range problem in, in Germany, you know, how, how are we gonna escort the bombers? And, you know, so with the Allison powered airplanes, they only had internal tanks. They didn't have any external tanks. Um, uh, they carried bombs on the A-36, and uh, I can't remember 100% if the A model had provisions. I think it did. I think they did actually add that so we could have an external fuel tank. But well, so then they decided, well, how are we going to get more gas inside this airplane? They actually, the British, took some of the guns off the wings actually and put fuel tanks in there to get extra range. They only used the engine. There's, there was two guns under the engine that shot through the arc of the propeller with the synchronizer. So that's all they used and, uh, just to get more range on it. So anyway, the, they, they thought about, well, let's figure out how we can make a, a, a Mustang go further. So they came out in, uh, so it was July 4th of 43, they came out with this program. They wanted to convert these Mustangs. So uh, the, uh, the Army Air Corps put out the specification that we need to do this. It's on July 4th. Uh, so they told North American, hey, can you stick a, a, an extra fuel tank in the back, in, you know, behind the pilot seat where the radios are, and get this extra range? And they said, sure, uh, when do you want it done? And so they're like, well, as soon as possible. So uh, 13 days later, they flew it. <laughs> they, they welded up a steel tank, 93 gallons, put it behind the back seat, and they, uh, they did a couple flight tests with it. and. Uh, and uh, let's see here, I've, I've got a, a quote in the book that uh, after they, they had a, one of the test flight, or I don't know, anyway, he was one of the higher ups in uh, at Wright Field. I'll find it here shortly. But basically, so they, they took it and, uh, okay, so uh, uh, Bob Chilton, he was test pilot for North American. So he said with a new tank, internal tank, and two 75 gallon drop tanks, he did a first uh, test flight, it was an hour and 20 minutes. So then on the 17th, he decided he was going to make a, a long range, you know, basically a simulated flight. So he took off um, a 1200 mile uh, cruise test, 30,000 feet with full in internal fuel. Uh, he, he flew, uh, uh, let's see here, yeah, so 1,200 mile cruise, simulated combat, 20 minutes of military power, total flight time, 4 hours and 45 minutes. And so the next day, they, uh, 
the Air Force guy, his name was uh, Bradley, he flew a full load of fuel, gas, uh, uh, ammunition, everything. So he took off from uh, Murak, uh, or, yeah, Murak, which is uh, uh, Edwards Air Force Base today, and he flew from there to Albuquerque. He says, I took off and flew to Albuquerque at 25,000 feet, simulated full power over the city for 15 minutes, then flew back to Edwards uh, with plenty of gas left. He says, the mission to Berlin has been accomplished. So that was their goal, was to try to get from England to Berlin to escort the bombers and so So that airplane, uh, the one that, that uh, they did that in, had a, a really interesting history. Uh, so after it got done with this test flight, uh, it wasn't, it was a very early B model, it was the 20th one built. Uh, they decided it wasn't combat worthy because it had been a test airplane. So they, they put it into a training role and they went to a training base in Florida. And uh, you know, so the pilots, as they got checked out, they went to a T-6 trainer, then they went to do the advanced and you know, conversion into fighters. Uh, they flew it there, but well, anyway, uh, the airplane was involved in the mid-air over uh, Florida, I can't remember what year, it was in 44, I think. And uh, anyway, two airplanes crashed into the lake. And sometime in the 80s, the guy was out, heard about these Mustangs or, that were crashed in this lake, he went out and salvaged it, brought it out, and uh, he took the fuselage, and you know, he, of course, it did crash into the lake, you know, the guy bailed out of it. And, uh, and uh, so he pieced together all the pieces he had, and he mounted it on a boat trailer, and he towed it around to, uh, aviation events, and so people could kind of see this Mustang, and uh, not knowing what its history was. So he eventually sold it, and it went to, it was out in uh, Idaho, uh, there's a company out there, uh, Pacific Fighters, they, they do restorations like we do. And they had it sitting out in their yard for years and years, and they finally decided, well, we're gonna sell this thing. And uh, not really knowing its history. Well, so Ron Fagan uh, from uh, Grand Falls, the uh, Fagan Fighters, purchased this airplane. Well. Right at the same time that happened is when this book came out. We started looking at it, well, this is the serial number. So the airplane he has is the very first Mustang that they tried, that they put the uh, long range tank in. And so we're helping them uh, start the restoration of that project. So that eventually we'll be the line of so it's great. Kind of an interesting Mustang fact, in a kind of small world type of thing. Who knew an aircraft would have such an extensive history? Thank you for that, Mark. Um, so, continue on with the questions. In your years of working at both Tri-State Aviation in Wabaton and Air Corps in Bemidji, do you have a favorite restoration project, or did you have one that you found to be very challenging? Well, the, the obviously, Corsair was my, that's my favorite airplane, and that was, that was kind of, kind of, it was the first, first airplane I got to work on with my a and license, you know, so that was kind of the, Pinnacle, you know, most people start off, you know, you're changing oil on a, on a Cessna 150 and you work the way up to more experienced stuff. I know, I just, I got lucky. <laughs> and, but that was uh, really a cool airplane. Uh, I got, we, we put a little jump seat in the back. Um, it was kind of a, kind of a thought as we did the airplane, but we didn't really put it in there. And we got it all done, and Jerry flew it, and we had a uh, air show lined up in Duluth. And so he's kind of like, well, got this air show in Duluth, then, you know, we kind of made that space back there. We didn't put any windows in or anything. And he says, but Cindy wants to go. So this uh, and this was like on a Wednesday, and he's going on a Friday. And he's like, do you think guys think you could put a seat in there so Cindy can go along? And I'm like, like, yeah, we can do that. So we threw a seat in it quick, and, and uh, she went with him to, to, to Duluth. And then uh, later on, I eventually I got, I got a ride, and, and I took two different uh, trips. One to Cleveland, I rode in the back. Uh, we took off on Wapman, we went to Minneapolis to do some business, uh, and then took off from there and we were going to go, uh, let's see, we were going to go direct from there to Cleveland. And uh, so we took off, well, from that, that line, you go across Oshkosh, you go right across Lake Michigan, right across Detroit to Cleveland. And so here we are, we're cruising along, we look down and see Oshkosh going by, it's, well, it's a lot of water out there. And all there was just this hole, you crawl through right behind it, Jerry's where his headrest is. And so I'm kind of sitting up there as close as I can. I'm looking out, and oh, I see the water. I'm like, oh, we don't have any light this in here, do we? <laughs> and uh, so we're cruising along while we get to the other side of the lake, and then we went over uh, Grand Rapids. And all of a sudden, the engine backfired. And well, the, the mixture control in the, on the, in the airplane, like most GA airplanes, you have a mixture control, and, and you can just kind of set it wherever you want. Well, 
On these engines, they're a, 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 basically a single point fuel injection, so it has a rich position and an automatic lean position and then off. Well, you can actually pull it out of the auto lean and manually lean it if you're doing really low power. So that's what he was doing, trying to extend his range, and it just didn't like that. And so it's like, on when we came home, we went around the lake. <laughs> so, but that was, uh, and I didn't want to trip, we went to Cleveland, uh, uh, I think that was 2003, so after 9-11, we were cruising along over, you know, just north of New York City, and you could look out and see the Manhattan and all that. It's really cool. But going to those events, you know, when I first started all this, it was all about the metal, you know, the airplanes. But the more you, the more you work on, the more people you meet and the stories they tell, and, and, and it gets to be more about the, the individuals that had something to do with them, whether they built the airplanes or, or uh, you know, maintained them or flew up. Uh, on that trip to, to Connecticut, it was the, they were having a homecoming for the Corsair, so they had five Corsairs there, and Jerry's airplane was the only one that was actually built there. And uh, so he was kind of the start of the show. And it was pretty neat. We got to meet the granddaughter of Chance Watt. So Chance Watt was the company that built the Corsair. So his granddaughter was there, and she hopped up and sat in the airplane. She's looking at us, oh, look, my name's on the red pedals. <laughs> and so that was pretty cool to, to, to that connection. And then there was people there that had built the airplanes. And uh, so we had a, a, a jury was just kind of walking the line, you know, talking to people. And there was this little old lady sitting there, and he started ch chatting with her. And she said, oh, yeah, well, I, you know, I put rivets in on the wing. And he's like, hey, well, come with me, show me where. And so she goes over and just in the gold wing partner, she said, yeah, this row right here, he's the one's my, my riveting partner and I, you know, she's sitting over there. And he's like, what do you mean? He's like, well, so they were lifelong friends, you know, all the way from 1946, when that airplane was built, until, until 2003, they, you know, they have been riveting partners on Corsairs, and just, you know, that lifelong uh, friendship. So. Awesome. Uh, so if you have any additional comments, or um, I guess what do you want people to know about you or the Mustang? Well, I don't know. It, uh, you know, I mean, it's obviously it's been a passion of mine, and I just, uh, you know, I've learned from all kinds of people, I've read all kinds of books, I've got a big library. Um, it, it seems kind of like almost an impossible job to get. You know, there's nowhere that teaches you how to do it. Um, but basically, we have, uh, I think, 59 people in our facility, so there's so 55 employees and four owners. And, uh, uh, most of the people we have working for us aren't in mechanics, they're just craftsmen. So they're people that know how to work with their hands. And that's what we're kind of fortunate in up in this upper Midwest that people still have those skills, you know, that they they, they know how to fix things. And a couple of our guys, uh, uh, one of them, he uh, built houses for a living. He was kind of, you know, he, he did the whole thing. You know, so he did rough framing and, and finished carpentry. And uh, so that's kind of what our job is, you know, there's structures and then there's detail. And I always say that, you know, like it takes two skills to, to build these airplanes. You have to be a, a farm boy mechanic that could just make something work or understands how it works. And then you have to also be a model builder to know how to do the detail. Because that, that, it takes both of these. And, and these airplanes, uh, for a lot of our customers now, uh, you know, it used to be where the, the doctor, the lawyer, the businessman could afford to own these airplanes. And, and Tim's airplane, you know, he bought it in pieces and built it. You know, so he put his time and sweat into it, but uh, most people don't have that passion. Anymore. They, 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 they see it, oh, it's cool, let's go buy them. Well, what's it cost? Well, I'll just write a check. And, and it, so it, it's gone out of the range of the average business guy to buy one just because of the rarity and the cost to maintain and, uh, and insurance and everything. You know? so it, so, but it, it's neat to be able to, I, I, early on I, I met a lot of guys that worked on their built their own airplanes, well, Jerry and Bob and Tim, and, I mean, there was a whole host of them from up in the Southern Midwest that, that owned these kind of airplanes, and, and now it's collectors, and, and so you, I don't know, it, 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 it's changed like it Absolutely. Let's put our hands together for Mark. All right, up next is Tim, or Toby, McPherson. Please tell us a little bit about yourself, um, where you're from, where did you grow up, uh, any schooling, stuff along those lines? Um, grow up? <laughs> we 
grow older, we're not supposed to grow up, right? But anyway, I, I um, did grew up in Erie, North Dakota, and uh, um, I'd watch Bob Pitts, or Bob Schrader fly his pits uh, around the Erie Dam, which was just a mile from us, and, and uh, that, that pits is over in the other hangar right now. And anyway, and then uh, that was on the west side of our home, hometown, and I, uh, then on the east side of town, we watched the crop duster all of our growing up life. I say we, I've got uh, seven brothers and, and three sisters, so it was survival of the fittest uh, around our house. But um, anyway, the graduated from here, or, uh, well, I didn't graduate from here, but, but went there three years, and then uh, they closed in 1967, and we went to Arthur, Arthur Dakota at that time, and uh, graduated from there. And then I, um, I want, having these guys fly around me all the time, and I get a ride with Bob Schrader, and he had a photography also, which uh, we've got right now, he bought brand new, and uh, I think they had four rides in it, uh, just little rides around the area and whatnot. But uh, um, we bought it back in 1992 and rebuilt it and just five years ago. It looks like brand new right now. And, and it's a 1973 model. So um, I flew with uh, um, one, I say seven brothers. Uh, I and another brother who uh, um, watched the crop duster most of the time. When he was spraying, that's how we got the idea. And that brother is 12, but is 10 years older than I am. And he's actually uh, been in Colorado uh, in his own spraying operation for 53 years now. He just finished his 53, 53rd year of being a crop tester out there. He, has, he, has, he hasn't flown himself for probably 10 years, but he's got three other pilots and, and, and farms out there also. But uh, him and I were, I was in second grade, he was just graduating and, and, and uh, watching the crop duster pull up over our house. Uh, he says, uh, looks at me and says, that's what I'm gonna do. And I looked up at him and, and I said, me too. And uh, I just finished just finished in my 47th year in spring, 44th year in owning the business. And uh, still love it. But uh, uh, how I got into the, from after college or at high school, um, I knew I wanted to spray. And I actually, uh, um, of course, Vietnam was going on at that time, and I had a brother over in Vietnam, and, and uh, um, I had a brother in Vietnam, I had a brother in, in uh, uh, Germany, and I had a brother in Minot, North Dakota, the one that, that I'm talking about flying. Uh, anyway, he was craft uh, card number one. And we, with 10 to 11 kids in the family, we couldn't afford to do nothing when we were growing up or anything. And anyway, uh, my brother goes to the recruiter and, and he says, okay, I've got draft card number one. Uh, you know, is there a chance if I enlist that I might be able to have a say in where I can go and see the world or something? And the recruiter said, yeah, maybe. So he signs up and uh, goes to Lackland Air Force Base uh, not with no intention of flying in the service, but uh, still had wanted to use the GI Bill to get uh, get his pilot's license and be a sprayer. Anyway, uh, he goes to Lackland and uh, does his, his uh, uh, training and, and gets transferred back up to Minot, North Dakota for three and a half years. He's still pissed. <laughs> that was, that was, anyway, uh, but he, he learned how to fly up there. Uh, actually sprayed up there for a year and, and continued in the service and then came back home and actually sprayed for the guy that we watched growing up. Uh, he sprayed for him for, uh, might have been 10 months, and he had two engine failures and, and that's the type, of, the type of equipment they ran. Well, that's when he looked for another job and found the one out in Colorado and he's been out there ever since. But I uh, wanted to wanted to follow suit uh, in getting the GI Bill to uh, um, to do my training and, do, and be a veteran. I had 
I said, I'm a brother in Nam. My, my dad was in World War II. Uh, another brother in Germany, and, and Jerry, the brother I'm talking about, uh, well, was in, uh, he didn't go to Vietnam, but uh, he was in the service during that time. And had another brother that was a brother in law that was out in D.C., all in general, type of thing. So being a veteran was uh, something that I wanted to do. Um, and, you know, especially today, it, uh, it's pretty neat. You know. So anytime I can, uh, any veteran stuff uh, that I can be involved with, with, with Boone, I try to do that. But after. I graduated in 76. This is 75. I was going to enlist and uh, go in and get 30 more bucks a month or something like that, whatever we got. Well, the uh, recruiters in the library at school in March of 75, and, and uh, uh, he, uh, I said, I'm ready to enlist. And he said, Well, why don't you wait to see what, we, what happens here at the you know, end of the month or in a month or two? I said, yeah, no problem. And I didn't even think about what might happen, but well, anyway, before I ended up uh, April 25th of 75, Simon Pell, and, and uh, they did away with the GI Bill for, for two years, the only time in history. And had I signed up back in, in March there, I'd have been okay. If you signed up before August of that year, you'd get the GI Bill or qualify for the GI Bill. That's the only time in history that they've done away with the GI Bill. Well, that was really at the time the only reason I was going to the service was to get that. In the veteran at that time, it didn't, I guess it didn't, wasn't as important as it is now. But, but anyway, I uh, um, started looking at colleges and, and whatnot, and ones that had flying uh, pr uh, curriculums, and, and science school was a good friend of grew up with, uh, was going to science school to be an electrician, and, and anyway, uh, he talked me into uh, going to look at science school, they had a business aviation program, and uh, I went down there, and that's how I, I mean, that's where, we, where I started, uh, uh, and learned how to fly at the airport there in Wapiton, and in turn, uh, met Jerry Back, who, who Mark had, had uh, worked with also, um, he was not the instructor. I didn't know get to know Beck until you know, I was called him Beck by his last name. That, uh, that, uh, he was just a, a best friend and, and uh, for a lot of years. Um, anyway, um, that winter, I, I got my license in December of 76. Uh, got my commercial license in May of 78. And it was spraying May 22nd of 78. And I was spraying that afternoon all of the Training that I did was pretty much practice and spraying. And, and Beck had bought it, and his partner had bought a decathlon, and, and that's what I did all my training in. If I wasn't spraying, I was doing loops and decathlon as a fully aerobatic inverted airplane. And so, I, uh, and of course, I flew with Bob Schrader in his pit, so I had to do a little. I come home on my weekends, and he'd teach me a new maneuver or something, and then I practiced for a while. Uh, by the time I got my commercial license, I, I thought I could maybe do an air show or something too, but it would be, uh, I haven't done much in that regard anymore. Spraying has been what I've always wanted to do, and, and uh, um, here we are 47 years later and 27,000 hours later. Uh, um, I've got a sign in my office that says, uh, God does not deduct the time you spent flying from your lifespan. Well, I've got about a little over three years built up. I want to know when that starts. <laughs> so I can start. Anyway, that's where we're at. And oh, I started in business. Uh, I flew for Beck for uh, three years, loaded form and flew form, and then uh, worked in the shop, got my inspect uh, um, aviation mechanic license, and then my inspector's license down there, and, and then uh, started on my own, spraying up a, up that Erie or the Page area. There was a wasn't a spray pilot up there. Um, at, well, for four years there hadn't been one there. And I ended up uh, renting and refurbishing the guy that we'd watched spray in that, engine, that airplane that had two engine failures. I took that down to Wapton and pr pretty much went through it and uh, not really completely restored it, but 
uh, fixed it so that it had fluid the first year, leased it from him, leased, leased his runway, and, and um, that was how I started in spray. And then that little, little $350 Menards hut was my office and my chemical shed. My, I had $5,000 into my whole operation when I started, I guess. And, and anyway, it's, um, we've grown to three pilots, three turbine airplanes, and, and uh, today. But uh, that was 1980 when I started on my own. But I still went back to Wapen for a number of winters and, and worked, still worked for Beth, which was uh, the best thing we could have done. Uh, best friend. And, uh, one of Beck's saying was, if, uh, if I can't fix it, it ain't broke. You know, and some people think, uh, who's that cocky little guy, you know, but it was, it was the truth and, and we were fortunate to work on him. So, so we, here we are 47 years later, but actually, since I met, got into the aviation world. So what was your first experience with Warbirds? Was that through Jared as well? Uh, okay. Um, no, it was it was through my brother that I'm talking been talking about. Uh, we were in the after I got my private license, I ended up working for back in the shop in the winter and, and uh, just to change, uh, repack and bury them. Just stuff in the shop, that, uh, and he was a—he uh, was actually a teacher first, as his mother was. He, he taught up at Red River, Red River High School in, in Grand Forks, and uh, um, that's probably where he uh, relayed to us, uh, you know, how to fix stuff. But, but uh, um, so I worked with him in the shop there and learned, learned, you know, uh, how to fix stuff and. and um, we're in the one Saturday, or we'd work till noon on Saturday all the time, and, and uh, uh, it's in May, March, March, and Bill uh, Beck and his partner, Larry Lindgren from Belva, uh, had just only been down there a year and a half, two years, when in the 70s, seven, spring of 77, they were down there in the fall of 75, so, and started their spray operation in, in, the, in the shop. Anyway, they, they're talking that they think they should be, uh, you know, do people in Wapman even know there's an airport out here? So they wanted to do an air show to, uh, you know, show people the airport and, and that there is an airport out there. Well, and then they got to talking, well, we, we need something that really would get people out here. And, uh, you know, Warbird, uh, you know, what kind of airplane could, could we get? And anyway, at Christmas time, I, uh, just before this, uh, uh, my brother was home for Christmas, and uh, um, he was showing us pictures. Him and his partner, he bought into the spray operation out in Colorado already. There, and uh, went out there in '71 and, and uh, worked for the guy and bought into the operation. And, and uh, anyway, they there was a Warbird dealer out there, Max Hoffman, in, in uh, Fort Collins, Colorado, and. He had, and I'm going to say the origi original boomer, it looked just like this one. The paint scheme's identical. And anyway, they had bought that Mustang for $100,000 with a spare engine. The whole airplane had 250 hours on it. And, didn't, and the only reason, the reason it didn't, it, it was a late 44 built. And, and uh, so it came in at the tail end of the war and it stayed stateside and it was more a trainer, well, it was a TF, but, but that's what they did with it, was, uh, uh, you know, flew around and, and got guys familiar with the airplane. And anyway, when they bought it, it only had 250 hours on it. And as this is painted, it doesn't have any invasion stripes or anything on it, so it doesn't have no military history, actually, other than, you know, the training type thing. So they bought it, and, that Saturday in Beck's office, uh, when he's, he brought up Warbird, and I said, "Well, uh, and I, you know, I'm all all ears listening to these guys, but I, I just I wanted to suck it all up as much as I could." But anyway, uh, I said, "You know, I think my brother's got a Mustang." And Beck turns around and he's at his desk, and, and he turns around, and Larry turns around, and he says, "Yeah, right." <laughs> I said, "Yeah, I, I think he does." 
Beck grabs the phone, and of course it was a real phone at that time, and he gives it to me and he says, call me. So I called my brother on Colorado and said, you got a Mustang, right? He said, yeah, yeah. You know, and, and my brother's pretty quiet and he and, and uh, anyway, here, a guy, I said, a guy wants to talk to you. And anyway, the, as, um, Beck's talking to him about having an air show, and, or I mean, he really had a Mustang, you know, and, and, um, and my brother said, yeah, we do. And, and that's about all he'd say. And, and, and he never looked about it or anything. But anyway, by the time they were done, they, they found out that, okay, the guard here, uh, was the Mustang was the first, in 1947, was the first airplane that they flew. Okay, so this is June 25th, 24th of, uh, 77, uh, the guard is planning their 30th anniversary of, uh, of being a guard. <laughs> and, okay, so with that, um, we had an uncle that was hired up in the, in the guard, and that's how they got involved with my brother. Uh, and anyway, they got him to come up for their air show. And I've got all the, I mean, the program and everything from that 1977 guard air show that's here, and the picture's over there too. And, um, anyway, uh, he did the air show in, in Fargo here on that Saturday then, and then we lined him up for, Beck did, for uh, on Sunday the 26th of June, and that program flyer is over there uh, um, of the air show back in June 27th, 26th of 1977. And, and anyway, he come come down and did a few, uh, did some aerobatic stuff, uh, but he only had 40 hours in it at that time, and, and uh, he was still trying to make a living spraying, you know. So, so that's where more of the time went. But, but that's how I really got interested, in it. and I think Beck did too, because uh, Bob had been involved or knew more about him. He's a few years more into the whole thing, but uh, uh, I think we all got. Got the bug right there, you know, so hearing that thing and and seeing it flying at you know 350 miles an hour, going, doing low passes and then rolling, and, uh, just just that sound and, and uh, so many veterans say that's the sound of freedom, that that engine, you know, and so many of them say that without that airplane we wouldn't have won the war. And the biggest thing is escorting the bombers, as Mark said, uh, that was a really turned the tide of the war. It was. Uh, the Mustang being all, and that with the drop tanks, it was able to ferry in from Italy, from France, from, from England, as he said, uh, you know, to get all the way into Berlin and, and escorting the bombers to, to bomb the, you know, the factories and the railroads, it, just everything. It was, a, it was the veteran, we've had World War II week here a number of times, and, and uh, the very first one in 2003, just about, I didn't have my, my Still, mine was still in pieces, but uh, Bob's Mustang was sitting right over by the door. And so many of those veterans came in and just stood there looking at that airplane. And just about everyone had tears in their eyes. You know, it just uh, it was that emotional. But uh, that's how we, that's probably how we got involved in the whole deal. You know, just to, uh, after that, after after that being or uh, World War II week, then I I had most Y two K two thousand was really a, a, a you know a turning point in the Warburg deal, but well it must have been because the price of stuff just pretty much doubled right after that, and I was fortunate in that uh, I had I bought uh, pretty much all of my parts. I had them all. They were just over in a pile over in one of our machine sheds and. And of course, my wife and uh, kids and employees and stuff would say, "Yeah, you're never going to get that built." You know, and, yeah, probably. We look at it and, and stuff. But anyway, the, uh, in 1988 is when I first started buying parts, and it, uh, and it was at the Reno Air Races. I ran into a guy that uh, had some brakes and wheels, that just just like what's right there, and. and uh, Give twenty five hundred bucks for him or something like that, and and, uh, and then and the landing gear, the landing gear did a bunch of work, but, but I had it. And anyway, so I 
I think they call them spray flying parts. There's nobody in the IRS here, is there? <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, the, um, from then I, I just started collecting when I could, and, and uh, uh, of course, brand was still my main deal and had to keep that going. But uh, uh, I was just so uh, fortunate that Jerry and Bob got into it deeper at, uh, in the 90s. And, and uh, they were running around, and, you know, looking at parts everywhere. And if they didn't need it, uh, they, of course, I was a hand-me-down guy. And I suppose they charged me one percent markup or something, but uh, I had it. And and before, like I say, Y2K or two, 2000 was really a benchmark for for the rover world because uh, um, stuff, that, like I say, it, it pretty much doubled in, in that same piece. So that same airplane today is probably four times what it was back then. And uh, um, so I was fortunate uh, to be able to uh, um, bought those spray plane parts. And, and, uh, um, and then after the, uh, World War II week there in 2003, that, the, having visited and posted those veterans, I knew I had to get had to work on it, and so uh, that winter I started. I took called it down to uh, down to Kindred. Um, I had worked on uh, valves and pumps and, and uh, smaller stuff at my place, or all the controls and everything I could. Uh, um, Bob Odegaard had built a business of rebuilding wings, and he we bought a, a set of wings on a, off a Mustang that had crashed in. Feedlot out in Chino, California. There's, at the Chino Airport, there's uh, cattle feedlots all around there. There was, I think, they're doing away with that now. But uh, anyway, there's still manure in the wings and stuff. And, and uh, that um, one wing wasn't too bad. The other one was pretty much built from scratch. Uh, those that was a, a big purchase, obviously. And, uh, I mean, at that time it was big. Today. And I just, about every winter we'll be, we add a few pieces and parts. And the engine uh, um, ended up buying from a, a good friend of Bex uh, that was an air racer uh, and bought that at their, Fortunately, these guys were financiers too, so that helped a bunch um, in my regard. Uh, uh, I had terms, uh, as I did on this engine, I, I gave them nine, ten thousand dollars a, a year for ten years, or for now with the ten, five years, I guess. And, and uh, I had my engine before then, and, and now today, uh, uh, at, I guess I'll say a hundred thousand dollar engine was, uh, today, if, uh, if you got one for three hundred fifty or something, you'd, you'd be lucky. And that propeller that Mark was talking about earlier, uh, um, I had all the blades from back, uh, I had the hub, I had dome and everything and, and from all different pieces or different areas of the country and even uh, down in uh, Honduras I had gotten a, a few pieces and stuff, you know, but uh, it was, a, as Mark said, that we're, um, Max said, you know, it's a passion and, and, and uh, that's what we did for entertainment. My wife didn't always like it, but she usually got to go to, we went to look for parts, she usually her and Donna and, and Cindy, the wives, uh, usually get to go along and they go do what they want. And of course, we, Beck and I, and Oder do what we want. And, and anyway, here we are today. And back to my brother's Mustang. Uh, he does not have, he had that for uh, for three years. Or him and his partner, and his partner, he was a third partner. And uh, the other guy was a farmer and had been for years out there in Colorado. And anyway, uh, they had it for three years and then dissolved and my brother went on his own and that's uh, uh, part of the 53 years I guess but they sold it back to the guy they bought it from uh, and they made some money on it and, and uh, he sold it to in 1981 to some guys in uh, he was from, like I say from Fort Collins he sold it to some guys in, in southern Idaho uh, next to the Oregon anyway and, and it burnt up in a hangar fire along with a number of jets and whatnot. 
uh, in, in August of 81, I believe it was. So the original Boomer airplane that sits just like that, uh, what was left was a data plate. And that data plate went around. That's what you need if, you, if you're going to build an airplane, you got to have a data plate. Okay, so, and I didn't have a data plate when I first started collecting parts. Um, and I was going to do like Bob did. Okay, as Mark said, there was 15,828 Mustangs of all variants built. The D model was the most built. Nine, there's like just under 10,000 built of those. Uh, like you said, 15, 1,600 of the A models, the uh, B models were in there too, and then the K model was, uh, I think there's only 500 or something like that. But uh, anyway, of the D models, there was just under 10,000. So today, there's only about 150 actually airworthy air today in the world of those 15,000 that were built back then. Um, okay, so how Bob did it was, Okay, and you can see the registration numbers of every airplane that's out there, including Mustangs. And so that's what they, a number of the Warburg guys did. They, they, uh, they had reflecting parts like I did, and, and they picked a serial number and a, and a you know, bureau number, and, and then they had a friend in, out of country or whatever, and, and they'd get a bill of sale. Well, that would get them the, the registration for that, that actually got him a data plate. And that's what Bob did, and, and uh, so he, the Mustang is in the limited category, uh, which in air aviation, any of the airplane stuff, there's limited, there's restricted leg and spring, or any uh, restricted category type of stuff, uh, of normal. Um, but anyway, the Mustang was in limited, and, and that's where you want to be if you've got a Mustang. Well, okay, I get mine pretty much done and ready to fly uh, in 2006, and, and I had one of Bob's uh, guys help a little bit uh, during the summers, I, I had to be spraying, and, but in the winters I'd go down there and, for three, four winters, I guess, and, and worked on it all the time, every day. But uh, I didn't have a data plate yet, and, and we were going to do just as Bob did when we got when we got it done. Well, March 28th of, night, of 2006, the FAA changes the ruling that you got to have an original data plane to, to have an airplane. Okay, so now I don't have a data plane and I don't have an airplane. I mean, I essentially don't have that. I mean, the airplane is physically there, but I'm not legal to fly because I don't have a data plane. What we we're going to do is just like Bob did. Okay, he did it way back before March 28th of 19, uh, 2006, 2006. What a coincidence it just happens to be when I need it. Well, okay, so we get it flying, it's, and it's on the uh, ex uh, exhibition. I, you can fly an ex any, kind, any airplane at the experimental exhibition, and that's what it registered under right now. But remember when I said that the original Boomer burnt up back in 2000, or yeah, back in 2001. Okay, so I followed that trail around the Warburg industry for, well, uh, when I first started on it, 1988 to, or, well, 2000. Uh, anyway, in 2007, it had been to about seven different owners and on um, seven different airplanes. And, and anyway, Jack Roush, the racing Jack Roush, uh, ended up having the original data, or original paperwork is essentially all it is, is a piece of paper about like this. Um, um, anyway, Jack Roush had the right to that data plate that he could make up. And I, I called him and, and uh, told him my situation, and just as I'm telling you. And he had two other projects, and he had two other sets of paperwork, and he says, well, let me think about it today. And he calls back the next day, and he says, uh, yeah, I, yeah, I'll, I'll sell you that. And, and uh, anyway, I, that, yeah, I ended up buying the data plate, and, and we're still working on getting it into the limited category, but the FAA says uh, we'll work with it. So, um, anyway, and they know about it, and uh, I think we'll, I, I just gotta sit down and uh, uh, quit rebuilding airplanes in the winter and making a living. 
them and, and just get that paperwork done and, and it'll happen. So. All right, uh, as we can see up here and then on Boomer itself, it is in the markings of the fourth fighter group. So at, at many of the air shows that you've been to um, over the years, have you heard any stories from any World War II or Korean War era Mustang pilots or any notable rides in the back seat? Um, I guess given the number of rides, uh, uh, there's an article over there on the table of a guy from Duluth, uh, uh, Heim, I should have looked at his name again, but uh, Heimbach, uh, he, his daughter had lined up, a, he flew Mustangs in the war and uh, uh, was an ace and he was on 93 years old. Is 2014, November of 14, uh, yeah, about nine years ago already. Alec Van Heimbeck, I think is his name. Anyway, uh, he was in failing health, but he he wanted the bucket list to be able to get in a Mustang again. His daughter knew that, and she was a pilot also. Anyway, they lined up uh, the ride, and, and uh, I think it was November 14th, if I remember right, it was on the form deal, but picture in the article is there. Anyway, she, I, I said I'd sure give him a ride if you could get him over here, and, and, and she did. Uh, anyway, uh, he didn't want to be interviewed by anybody. He, I mean, he was just like most veterans and uh, are so humble and quiet, and uh, you got to pry anything out of him. And, and having been around here and working with veterans, uh, man, that's, that's really what, they're so humble. Anyway, the, uh, somehow the TV guy, all the channels on TV, the radio, KFGO, found out about him coming, and I didn't say a word. So I don't know. I, I think, well, anyway, I do you know who did. But, but he, uh, has, I was down here uh, giving some kids tours, uh, I think, that morning. I said, uh, as the museum does often, uh, um, do tier, tours and stuff here. Anyway, that morning I came down a little bit early because I knew he was coming and I, I wanted to make sure I got out there before anybody else did to, to make sure that, uh, you know, nobody was going to um, spook him or because he was, he was pretty fragile. Anyway, uh, I'm doing the tour and here comes, uh, I don't know, two or three TV stations and KFGO guy that, and I thought, oh, shoot. I said something else, but anyway, uh, so I finished, I, I don't finish up with the kids, I just hightail it out the door, and, and they, they're already out there, and he looks at me like, uh, okay, you said there weren't going to be any TVs or cameras or any of this stuff, and I said, I, I tried, sir, I apologize, but I think they want to they want to meet you and hear your story, and, and I said, I'll, I'll be with you all the time, and, and uh, anyway, we came in, and and uh, this was about 9 o'clock in the morning, 9.30 I think it was. And we had a table set up for him and, and uh, he was doing the interview. And, uh, I think uh, I think the Channel 6 guy, one, um, I don't remember who it was, but anyway, uh, he, he felt comfortable with them. So they, all three stations were in on the interview and whatnot. And, and they had, of course, it's, it's dark this time of year, uh, and they got to get back to Duluth by before dark because they got they're on a farm strip. Um, anyway, uh, um, we go until um, 1.30, 2 o'clock on the interview, and he's about beat. And I said, okay, we got we if you're gonna get the ride and get back to Duluth before dark, we're gonna have to get going. So. Anyway, he, uh, we got flying, and, and like I say, it's, it's going to be an hour and a half, two hours back to Duluth, and, and we fly for only about a half hour, but we circle around town, and, and uh, he says, you know, that that's good enough. Uh, and I, I turned around, and I said, are you sure? Uh, I mean, he said, no, I, I needed that. And I turned around, and, and here he's got tears in his eyes. You, you, you can sure read that article there. But that's a memorable one. There's 
and a few others too. But, uh, a Vietnam vet uh, had cancer, and that was on his bucket list also. And the kids, he had three kids, and it was in the spring, well, it was May, May 12th, I believe. And, and uh, his, one of his sons had called asking if, if I would give him a Mustang ride. That's, that's on his bucket list. He's got terminal cancer. And he is a Vietnam vet. That's the first thing I asked, is he a veteran? And, and uh, he said, yes, he's a Vietnam veteran. And uh, I said, okay, I'll absolutely give him a ride. Uh, we were farming a little bit, I guess, at the time. And went to spraying already. And anyway, I said, uh, uh, let me call you when I can when I get a chance and, and or, you know, and anyway, uh, uh, we were busy and I get a call about two weeks later from the boy or son again and he said, boy, we'd sure like to get that ride. My dad is, is going backwards in a hurry here. And, and uh, I said, okay, how about, and this was, I think it was a Friday afternoon or something. And I said, how about Sunday morning? And I think Saturday, the weather was crummy or something. And, and no, it was Saturday. We did it that, that morning. The next morning, I said, okay, let's let's do it. Anyway, they come out, and uh, um, yeah, he was gravely pale, and and uh, we got him in the Mustang or with the kids' help and stuff, and, and um, I asked him where he wanted to fly to, and he said, just, where do you live? And I said, oh, and he says, well, let's go just look at the countryside. And, and uh, uh, we did that. <clears throat> and then uh, came back and circled town. And uh, we circled his place, South Fargo. Uh, new development or whatever it was. I don't remember exactly the name of it. But uh, I, um, we were at minimum altitude to what we needed to be. And uh, we could see his wife out there was on the radio and on the intercom and he says there that's my wife and she was in the driveway waving and she couldn't come out with the kids. She just couldn't. And uh, anyway we land and, and uh, we get him out and he's almost like a different person. I mean he's talking he's talking about the history of the airplane and how how much he enjoyed the ride and and uh, anyway then he I mean I bet it was ten minutes or more that, that we talked, and uh, we're still sitting in the airplane. I, yeah, we didn't get out yet, but when we got out then, and he just, uh, he, he grabbed me and he hugged me. And uh, we went to the, well, we came in, and the kids just did the same. And as he was walking out the door, he says, I'm there, I'm there. That's that's probably the most memorable one. Two weeks later, I found out that he passed. So. Well, um, do you have any closing remarks? Um, any individual people you'd like to thank? Well, but, um, back in Odegaard, uh, um, they were just best friends. I mean, they're mentors. They're Tutors, they, they're, um, we're with them about every day. You know, when we're, when I work with them, we, you know, as Mark and, uh, and we travel a bunch together too uh, on forward trips. And, um, it was just uh, and those those are two guys. My older brother too is another one. Fun ride. I hope it continues for a while. All right, well, let's put our hands together for our amazing speaker. <laughs> before we open it up to the audience for questions, um, we do have one more announcement. Um, we are very fortunate. I know uh, Mark mentioned it earlier, but there is uh, P51K at Fargo Air, the airport here. 
and the owner has very generously allowed us to go and visit it uh, tonight. So um, I think we'll just head over there from here. Uh, we just ask that while you're over there, please uh, no photography um, and just be respectful of your surroundings. Uh, this hangar that we're visiting is not affiliated with the Air Museum in any way. Uh, so we would just appreciate if you guys would uh, treat you with respect. Um, if the owner would like to come up and say a few words about it. No, okay, no. Um, but yeah, uh, we will um, go from there. And then, yeah, if you have any questions, feel free to approach uh, Mark or Toby uh, afterwards. But other than that, thank you guys so much for attending.